talk. We'll be given by Professor Jovanen, and his uh, talk title is Flow of Heating for Normal Fluid in Thermal Current Flow in a Small Heat Flux. Um, well, I, I commented on the fact in my talk earlier talk that um, counterflow turbulence had been discovered what 65 years ago, but it still provided us with unsolved problems. And uh, if you take away from this particular presentation one message, then that message is that. There are still problems in understanding really what is going on in counterflow turbulence. So let me first of all remind you of what happens in counterflow turbulence um, to the superfluid and the normal fluid as you increase the heat current. At the smallest heat current, the superfluid flows in the frictionless way, there are no vortex lines, but the normal fluid uh, flows in a laminar fashion through the tube that you're using. And then, um, as you increase the heat current, you move into a regime where the um, you start creating a vortex tangle in the superfluid component, but the normal fluid uh, continues to flow uh, apparently in a laminar fashion, although the profile of the laminar flow may be modified by the mutual friction. And then if you increase the heat current still further, uh, you get uh, a transition to um, a large scale turbulence, coupled turbulence in the two fluids, uh, superimposed on the uh, small scale tangle, which you have in this regime here. Now I'm going to be concerned entirely with this region here. And I want to be concerned with what the flow of the normal fluid is, is actually doing in this region. Because the normal fluid, of course, is interacting with the vortex cores in this region. <coughs> At first sight, you might say, well, um, the normal fluid may have flows still in a, in a laminar fashion. Um, it's um, Profile would be modified by mutual friction, but perhaps you have no small scale motion in the normal fluid. But that is not the case because the mutual friction, of course, is localized in the regions very close to the vortex cores. And that mutual friction has to be transferred to the whole of the normal fluid and that can only occur if the normal fluid flow is modified so that the transfer of energy can occur through the action of the normal fluid viscosity. Now, in a sense, this is an old problem. Um, it was first discussed to some extent in the 1950s when Henry Hall and I were trying to work out the effect of mutual friction because the effect that I'm talking about will lead to a dragging of the normal fluid by a moving vortex. And so if you want to know how fast the normal fluid is actually flowing relative to the vortex, near its core, you have to understand this dragging effect. And we made some crude estimates of that um, back in the 1950s. Um, more recent studies by Carlo Berenghi and his colleagues have addressed the same sort of problem in more detail. 
But the situation has changed significantly in the last year or so because for the first time we now have some relevant experimental evidence. Before that we did not have any ev experimental evidence and it was all speculation. Um, why did we study this effect? This dragging of the normal fluid by the localized vortices. Is it of any fundamental importance? Or should we just forget about it? <coughs> it's of course important if you want, you want to calculate the magnitude of the neutral friction, but is it any more important for more fundamental reasons? Um, well, what I want to emphasize in this talk, perhaps, is that one can now see this dragging effect by means of suitable tracers. And that illustrates that modern visualization techniques um, are able to tell us quite a lot about the detailed flow that is going on in superfluid systems. Um, actually, I think myself that understanding the dragging effect, if you like, um, involves some quite interesting classical fluid mechanics. Um, I may have got my classical fluid mechanics wrong in this respect, but let us see. But maybe, just maybe, what is going on here may be of some more greater fundamental importance in this work for a reason that I will come to towards the end of my talk. Um, the effect I'm talking about was of course mentioned by Carlo Berenghi in his introductory lecture, and that is sufficient perhaps uh, to, uh, for us to regard it as of some importance. So what I'm going to do is first of all to describe the relevant experimental results, and then I will give you a very preliminary uh, speculative discussion about their interpretation. The experiments involve particle tracking methods using particles, micron-sized particles of deuterium. So we have a heat current um, in this regime where you have a tangle of vortex lines, but the um, motion of the normal fluid is at least roughly laminar. And you can measure the velocities with which the particles, these tracking particles, move. You can look at their probability distribution functions of velocity. And typically, uh, in the regime that I'm discussing, this PDF looks like this, where this peak here in the velocity of the particles corresponds to particles that are trapped on vortex lines. And so this velocity here is the velocity with which the vortex lines are moving. And this peak here is, arises from particles which are not trapped on vortex lines, but are moving with the normal fluid. And so this average velocity here is the average normal fluid velocity. Now, what uh, my friends <coughs> Tallahassee have been doing, and I should say that I'm not involved, of course, in these experiments, except as a sort of observer. <laughs> and what they did was to look at the fluctuations in the normal fluid velocity as seen by one of these particles. And you can look at uh, fluctuations of two types. You can look at fluctuations which are in the streamwise direction, that is in the direction of the heat current, or you can look at fluctuations which are at right angles to the heat current. Now the fluctuations at right angles to the heat current 
are negligible, negligible they're small apparently. Um, they are down here in the noise. But fluctuations in the velocity in the streamwise direction are very much larger. Up here. And this velocity here, which is the a measure of the fluctuations in the velocity in the streamwise direction of these particles which are following the normal fluid. Those fluctuations are something like 30% of the average normal fluid velocity. And so, which is very large. So the flow of the normal fluid on fairly small length scales as being measured by these small particles is by no means what you might think, subject to quite big fluctuations. <clears throat> you can observe not only um, the fluctuations in velocity, you can measure velocity correlation functions. That was how the velocity changes with time, indicated by this correlation function here. And the best data probably are these data here, with a normal fluid velocity of about six millimeters per second. Um, and you'll see that the um, correlation lasts for a time of the order of a tenth of a second. And that means that the particles that are being uh, suffering this um, fluctuations in velocity, these fluctuations last for a, a tenth of a second or so, during which time, and that's the velocity observed by a single particle, during which time the particle will have moved a considerable distance. In fact, a distance which is equal to about 30 times the vortex line spacing. And so these fluctuations are not only uh, rather large, they seem to exist over quite large length scales. So we conclude then from the experiments that in thermal counterflow at small heat fluxes where the normal fluid is thought to be uh, in laminar flow, the velocity of the normal fluid is certainly not uniform on the small scale, but seems to fluctuate by about 30% and that the fluctuations uh, extend over distances of perhaps 30 times the intervortex spacing. And the fluctuations occur only in the streamwise direction. Um, well, let us assume that these are the fluctuations in the normal fluid velocity, which through the action of viscosity allows the mutual friction force, which of course is very localized near the core of the vortex, to spread throughout the normal fluid. So what I want to do now is to um, start thinking about uh, the meaning of these results and uh, try to start thinking about the, the possible dragging effect <coughs> of a moving vortex, dragging the normal fluid in its neighborhood, and seeing whether this sort of dragging effect can account for the experimental results. Now, um, 
when Henry Hall and I were working on this problem of the dragging in the 1950s or so, we uh, took the view that uh, to some degree the vortex in its interaction with the normal fluid can be thought of as a sort of cylinder which is moving through a viscous liquid. And the drag on the cylinder is the mutual friction force. So I'm going to start by saying a little bit about um, the flow of, of a, a viscous fluid um, past the cylinder. So this is just purely classical fluid mechanics. Um, it turns out that the, and of course this is at, 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 at low speeds, so in a sense it's a, it's a low Reynolds number. Um, it turns out actually that um, you might think at first sight that this is a sort of uh, similar to the Stokes problem <laughs> of a moving sphere through a, a, a viscous fluid. But it's actually much more difficult than the, than, the, than the Stokes problem because it turns out that you cannot find a solution of the linearized Navier-Stokes equation that satisfies all the boundary conditions associated with this flow. Nevertheless, by using what is technically called the Ocene approximation, you can get a solution to the problem which takes some account of the nonlinear term in the Navier Stokes equation. And the results of that calculation I've set out here um, without going into the details of how they're obtained. It turns out that there are two characteristic lengths in this problem. Um, one is, of course, the uh, radius of the, of the cylinder, and the other is a quantity that I've called lambda, uh, which is the kinematic viscosity of the fluid divided by the velocity with which the um, cylinder is moving. Or if you like, the velocity with which the flow is moving relative to the cylinder. And the form of the velocity field that you get from calculations based, as I say, on the Ocene approximation are shown here. Let's not worry about the form, mathematical form of these, but this, um, this form here applies if the distance from the cylinder is small compared with this parameter lambda. And you then get this sort of flow here, which is perhaps what you might expect to get for flow um, past a moving cylinder. But if you go into the region where you are at a distance from the cylinder, which is large compared with lambda, the flow looks quite different. And in fact, it takes the form of a wake behind the moving cylinder. Uh, the perturbation in the flow is, takes the form of a, of a flow in a wake towards the cylinder. And then conservation of mass requires that you have a radial flow away from the cylinder. So this is the wake part, and this is the radial flow, which allows for conservation of mass. And I've expressed these velocities here in terms of the force that is acting on the cylinder. Um, now, um, you'll notice that, and I've written these formulae up, up again, you'll notice that the, these velocities become independent of the radius A of the cylinder. Um, if you are at a distance from the cylinder, which is large compared with its radius. And so, um, if the 
radius of the cylinder is very small, then, as is the case if we're considering uh, this sort of analog of a vortex, then uh, you can probably neglect this term entirely, except very close to the vortex. Um, and so what I'm suggesting then is that this sort of field here uh, is the velocity field that is produced by a moving vortex. Um, I, I can go through it in slightly more detail if necessary, but I don't want to do that. Um, I should say that um, this result can be compared with some <coughs> simulations that were published by Carlo Berenghi and his colleagues in the year 2000, in which they uh, simulated, computer simulated the flow uh, past the vortex in a way which is in some ways more sophisticated than what I was doing. But I suspect, and, and their result is really very different from, from mine. Um, the, 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 there appears to be no wake, and the parameter lambda seems not to enter into their uh, simulations. Um, I suspect myself that um, these simulations uh, are not quite right, um, and I suspect that, that they were using probably too small a computational box, and perhaps more seriously, they did not wait long enough in their simulation to achieve a steady state. And you'll see in a moment that not achieving a steady state uh, is Essentially, a rather serious matter. Well, if you accept what I'm proposing rather than what Carlos' uh, people are proposing, then uh, the perturbation to the velocity by a moving vortex is uh, shown here. Um, in practice, um, given the sort of numbers that we saw in the, um, in the experiments. Lambda, this characteristic length lambda is very small. It's much less than an intervortex spacing. And so what you see is mainly the wake, which extends uh, this, uh, these distances here, are normalized by the intervortex spacing so that the wake is extended to eight or nine intervortex spacings. But this is really smaller than what we see experimentally. Um, and so it looks to me as though um, you cannot explain um, the experimental results um, from Tallahassee uh, by thinking in terms of a single vortex. Before I go on, however, let me just um, say a little bit about the physics behind what is uh, this um, formation of the, of the wake. And in fact, the physics behind the Ocene approximation, which is actually really simple and straightforward. Let's imagine that we have a fixed cylinder here with flow past the cylinder. Um, what the cylinder does is to generate vorticity in the fluid. And that vorticity diffuses outwards from the cylinder. And indeed, this uh, log term here, which looks rather strange, um, is simply the result of solving the two-dimensional diffusion equation <laughs> in cylindrical polar coordinates. 
But this description of, of uh, vorticity diffusing away from 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 the moving from this from this cylinder when the when there's a flow past it um, assumes that this velocity flow here is not interfering with this um, vorticity. Well, that's okay as long as the as long as the diffusion of vorticity is occurring sufficiently rapidly in comparison with the velocity u. But as you go move further away from the cylinder, the, that velocity is um, the velocity and the, the diffusion falls away, and eventually, um, at a distance which actually is related to lambda, uh, and in fact is actually about eight lambda, um, the velocity of diffusion, as it were, falls to a value of order u. And at that point, u starts to affect the um, vorticity by swinging it round behind the moving cylinder, and that's how the, the wake is cre created. Well, it looks as though, as I say, that a single vortex will not produce the kind of effect that is seen in the experiments. And so the question then is whether a whole collection of vortices will produce the right sort of effect. Um, and here I've just done a very, very simple uh, calculation. I've taken a collection of rectilinear vortices. I've made them more parallel, but I've dis distributed them randomly in this sort of way here. So this, is a, this is flow through a random collection of rectilinear vortices or parallel to one another. And we apply a velocity and we simply add together the weights that are produced from these. But, um, that, that addition is uh, probably okay if the velocities are fairly small um, because the Ocene approximation is actually linear in the velocity disturbances. But uh, whether you can describe a 30% change is another matter. Anyway, what you get then is uh, things that look like this <laughs> for the, the weight produced over here. Uh, of course, the details depend on the, the detailed way in which you uh, arrange these vortices, and these are for two different realizations of the vortex already. And now the effect is much bigger and extends to a much larger distance. Well, of course, you can use my model to calculate this correlation function. And the correlation function calculated on, for the model looks like this. And it looks nice in some respects. Uh, this distance here is in, uh, measured in units of the intervortex spacing. And you'll see that the thing falls off at around 30 or so vortex spacings, which is about right. And the magnitude of the fluctuation is also about right. But the correlation function looks very different in shape from the observed one. In fact, this is a rather strange shape. And I don't know the reason for that. It may be the model is too crude, there's an effect of vortex motion. It's a question of whether you can simply add together the wakes. And of course, there's the assumption that 
the both expositions are random. Question? Question? Yes. So in the experiments, the particles are 10 microns. And so the space that they're that that they're that they're exploring is going to be no, it's I mean yes. it's large compared to the yeah. vortex core diameter. Oh, yeah. So it seems oh. like you're oh. you know the 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 we don't, we don't know how how wide these regions are. That's the trouble. We only know their lengths. But if, but if I look at the the, if we you know, look at wire if, uh, if analogy. Look at two, two particles, we could say if there's a correlation between the motion of two particles, then we could say something about the width of the disturbance. Particles are not frozen hydrogen, particles are atoms. No, no, no. no, 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 no. It's a security. Sorry. So uh, the, the model is very, very crude, but it has some features which seem to agree with experiment. But that doesn't mean to say that it's right, of course. So let me conclude then. <coughs> um, one important conclusion, I think, is that um, quite detailed aspects of the flow of the normal fluid in this case can now be visualized and what I'm interpreting as, as, as a dragging of normal fluid by moving vortices can be seen. Um, perhaps we have some understanding of what is happening but at best it's incomplete and it may of course be completely wrong. Of course a better theory must be based on simulations that involve realistic vortex configurations interacting realistically with the normal fluid um, and moving in a realistic fashion. In principle that sort of calculation is uh, beginning to be possible, as was explained by Makoto Tsubota in his talk. But it's still a tough thing to use if you want to address this problem here, because the spatial resolution you require is uh, really very, very high. You need to look at distances which are uh, um, less than the vortex, intervortex spacing, whereas Makoto's simulations, I think, at the moment, are uh, essentially the the resolution is is many many intervortex spacings. So Makoto is not, probably not going to go away and do this simulation straight away. <laughs> but it's something that we might consider doing in the long run. Um, let me just finish with a comment. Uh, is what, we've, what I've been talking about, particularly if you like the experimental result, let's not, not worry too much about the theory. Um, the induced fluctuations in the velocity of the normal fluid are surprisingly large. They're 30% or so of the Mean, super, mean normal fluid velocity. And I do wonder slightly whether it is these fluctuations which a slightly higher heat current trigger a transition to large scale turbulence. And pursuing that idea, crazy <coughs> though it may be a little bit further, it may be that pulling the normal fluid through an array of vortices is a bit like pulling a fluid through a disordered grid. And maybe uh, the sort of 
fluctuations that I've been talking about are the beginnings of grid turbulence produced in that way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I can confirm that this kind of uh, distribution is observed in other experiments and in Prague as well for all those. That's fine. But I have a problem just uh, uh, with uh, the interpretation because the particle actually interacts simultaneously with both velocity fields, with normal fluid field and with the superfluid velocity field. Because the Delambert paradox only works for steady motion. So the part is a force from the side of the superfluid on a particle, which is not taken into account in your, in your calculation. So the question is that the particles are interact with the superfluid and the normal fluid, and here only the interact with normal well, fluid. Well, they are, of course, scattered by, by, by the vortices, but I don't think that kind of effect can lead to what we actually see. That's then, Ladir's question is whether the superfluid itself has any effect on the particle motion, in other words. Is. Um, I, su I suspect we're very close to the vortex, it does have an effect, yes. But hopefully not, not very far from it. Right. Thank you. Um, there was the question in an earlier talk by Thomas Schaefer on this. Sorry? Um, th there was a question in an earlier talk by Thomas Schaefer about the mutual friction between the superfluid and the normal uh, flow expressed in terms of this <coughs> zeta 3 viscosity. Um, am I right that in the absence of vortices, you would agree there is no such mutual friction? There is no mutual friction. Yeah, so, so. That, that was my understanding, but I was confused by the answer. Any other question? So in the, 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 the fluctuations of the normal fluid are uh, both, so you, you observe both positive and negative fluctuations, or only the, the, the fluid is only slowed down? <coughs> so the fluctuations in the normal <coughs> field, do you see both positive and negative fluctuations, or is the fluid only slowed down? Hi, how's that question? Both, both, both directions. Both directions. We have not started whether there's any asymmetry. Maybe there is. Question. Of course, the average velocity um, <coughs> across any cross section has to be independent of, of um, uh, it's determined by the total heat current. So if you slow up the superfluid, the normal thing in one place, you have to accelerate it in another place. Okay, so you, a very naive question. When our fluctuations have dissipation, right, uh, in very fundamental systems, do you see an effect on the temperature uh, flow uh, when you do when you do this? You produce some heating, yeah? so we have fluctuation dissipation theorem. So you see some weeks into this uh, velocity distribution. You know, for the normal fluid, mm -hmm. so what is the associated dissipative uh, uh, factor perhaps, with these fluctuations? Even the uh, this is a question to the speaker. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, with the, what is the effect of dissipation from these velocity fluctuations? <laughs> effect of dissipation in what? Um, in the fluctuations? Yes. yes. Fluctuation dissipation. And yeah. Fluctuation dissipation theorem. Uh, so I can associate to any type of fluctuations, like in Brownian motion, uh, an effective temperature. Yes, I mean, clearly they, they, they must contribute to the, to, the, to the mutual friction, if you like. Yes. 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 Yeah. And what, what would be the observable then associated to this? Mm -hmm. What would be the observable associated with that? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, the uh, yeah, I don't need to think about that. It's a very good question. I got it. So, can I consider the couple of this for this problem? So, as you say, it's very difficult to make the final mesh bend for the dense vortex sample. But does it make sense to make a, a 
uh, fine animation for dilute cortex tunnel. So the thing is, the uh, normal mesh of the normal fluid should be smaller than the intercortex spacing, right? It's important. So does it make sense to uh, make a some make a mesh uh, small, uh, smaller than the uh, dilute cortex? Lattice. Does it make sense to have a mesh that's smaller than the dilute vortex lattice? Does it make sense? It so makes sense for the yes, well, for the couple of the dynamics. Then we the for couple the couple of dynamics, it would have to do that, yes, uh -huh. because the if if what I'm saying is right, then the um, uh, the the scale on which the yes. uh, normal fluid velocity is changing. Is it can be smaller than the intervortex spacing? Oh, oh. If so, it, it's just hope, hopeful. Okay, one question. Perhaps. So it may seem a little bit philosophical whether the normal fluid is dragging the vortices or the vortices are dragging the normal fluid, but uh, it seems that there might be a difference depending on the temperature, how much normal fluid you have got. Uh, when one that's, of that's the effects a, that's is smaller that's than the other. That's a good question, and unfortunately, we have not yet been able to study the temperature dependence of the effect. <laughs> Last question. Yeah, please. So may, maybe more of a comment, but this situation that you describe of dragging a normal fluid for an array of vortices sounds a lot like what might be happening in some parts of a neutron star. And these velocity fluctuations are quite large, so you think they could be linked with timing noise of these longer term spin variations. It sounds very similar as a system. <coughs> All right, um, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>